Well, he was his own establishment <laughs> in Canberra, really, uh, writing for Nation Review in his unique way. And uh, although, although um, we all got a lot of laughs from what he was writing, there was always a serious threat, and he was writing Australian politics like nobody else in the country, uh, and has continued to do so ever since. So before we even start, I'd like to offer my personal thanks to Mungo for that. Now, having said that, uh, Mungo, it was about the time that I got to know you, I thought maybe just a little bit before Don Whitington, who was in the Canberra Bureau, uh, brought out a book called The Twelfth Man Question Mark, and it was just before the 72 election, and Gough was the twelfth man. And I've got no idea, because I can't find the book anymore, but I've got no idea why he based... It was on the 11 Prime Ministers before Gough, but he obviously left quite a few out. Quite a few, yes. Um, what I wanted to start with, and I know that by the time we get to questions, and there'll be plenty of time for that, that uh, a number of you may want to talk about contemporary events. So I'm going to give due credit to the book by focusing mostly on the book in this initial chat. Um, what I wanted to start with, Mungo, was, um, was just focusing on, the say, let's say, the first decade or thereabouts uh, of Australian politics from Federation, because uh, it's a period that most Australians don't really know about, and people of my generation, although through work I've had to kind of pick up on it, but uh, people of my generation learnt bugger all about, about our own country's politics, um, not much beyond the Rum Rebellion in my case. Uh, so it's always, um, I think, interesting to, to hear about that, those early years, but particularly the first decade, which was where the, the, the blueprint for Australian politics really began to be established. I mean, the beginnings of the Labor Party and so on. Absolutely. And it was that first decade, really, where Parliament took, took shape. Um, the first federal parliament was composed, I suppose, of well, not only all sorts of people, but all sorts of parties that were mainly independents. The ones who weren't independents were more or less freelance anyway. They, they moved from party to party as it suited them, a bit like, say, Papua New Guinea today. And I think when we criticise Papua New Guinea politics today, it's wise to look back on our own and how long it took our own to settle down. Because before Federation, there was a century of... Of colonialism, oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, I think the thing about those early days was that nobody really had a clear idea what even what the country was, let alone where it was going. That first parliament was composed inevitably of politicians who'd been members of the colonial parliaments and who still really were thinking in terms of their own state and colonial loyalties. They weren't thinking in terms of national issues at all. There were a few exceptions, um, people like Edmund Barton, Alfred Deakin, and uh, perhaps Charles Kingsley. There were, there were a couple of them around who really did have an idea of nationhood, but most of them were, you know, squabbling for power and, were, and retained their old ideas of the colonial loyalties. I mean, the Victorians were protectionists. They wanted tariffs, they wanted trade barriers, they wanted subsidies, they wanted all those kind of things. The New South Wales people were by and large free traders. Um, they were in favour of a more open economy. But um, that was about where the divisions were. Apart from that, there were no serious ideological positions taken at all. And, of course, in that first parliament, the 1901 parliament, there was also just a handful of Labourites, people elected as Labour members. And I don't think um, anybody in that first parliament took them terribly seriously. Labour was sort of thought of as a, a bit of a fringe movement, uh, something those uncouth workers had put together during a smoke oven. It, it wasn't going to go anywhere, who cared anyway? The real power was, of course, with the landholders. The, they, they were the ones who mattered. In fact, the first Labour government in the world was the Queensland government, at la and it lasted six days in about 1890. That's right, or yes. Yeah. And the first federal Labour government, of course, was the government of Chris Watson in 1904. And that was a, a government formed by grace and favour, really, of Alfred Deakin of the Protectionist Party. The numbers in that second parliament, the 1904 parliament, 
were pretty much evenly divided three ways. It was known as the Three Elevens um, Parliament in cricket terms. Um, so the free traders, the protectionists and the Labor Party had about the same numbers and as a result they swapped more or less swapped leadership at random. You started off with Alfred Deakin and the protectionists in the chair. They were propped up by the Labor Party. Eventually there was a crack there so Deakin handed over to the Labor Party and said see if you can bloody well do better. Not and much. No, not much, as it turned out. So Deacon then changed sides yet again and handed over to the free traders with his support. And that dragged on for a while until, fortunately, the parliament was prorogued and a new election was held. But in those in those early days too, a number of certainly of the of the those who stood out as leaders or would be leaders had come through the constitution as well, hadn't they? The, the, they the, were, the writing of the, yes, the drafting the, of the constitution. The, the people we like to think of as the founding fathers, I've been using an American parlance, um, and we think of them with the same sort of reverence in some ways as the Americans thought of theirs. Um, but in fact, they weren't very different from today's politicians. They were, you know, the same mixture of idealism and ambition as, as today's politicians. Uh, they were on the whole more bearded. That was a major <laughs> distinction. Well, <laughs> yeah, you've only got one with a beard on the front cover, and that, I think, is Deacon, isn't it? Deacon, yeah. But Alfred, Alfred Deacon was notably bearded, but our, our first Prime Minister, of course, Edmund Barton, stood out as the clean-shaven member. Actually, you know, just looking at it, uh, Kevin Rudd might have done a little better with a beard. <laughs> Kevin Rudd might have done a little better with a great deal more facial covering, I think. <laughs> Possibly a balaclava. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he doesn't believe in stealth. <laughs> uh, so, in, in that first decade or so, I mean, as you say, it, was, it wasn't quite like changing, changing leaders like changing socks and changing governors, but there were a number of... Uh, I mean, I, I meant to count and I stopped, but there's, a, there's at least five leaders in the first ten years. Oh, yes, at least five. Um, I would have to count them myself. George Rigg was the fourth. Um, so, so uh, Cook came in then, uh, Fisher came in, that makes six before, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you've got, you've got a, re a reasonable number. But it, the things didn't really settle down until 1909, when suddenly the Conservative parties, the protectionists and the free traders, both realised that the real threat was Labor. Labor was on the upsurge, everybody had thought it would be a flash in the pan. It kept gaining in popularity. They had ended up with a formidable presence in Parliament. And in 1909, finally, the free traders and the protectionists settled their differences and became an anti-socialist junction juncture. Um, very stormy, very ugly scenes in Parliament, so much so that the Speaker of the day actually dropped dead in his chair trying to control the chamber. And Harry Jenkins thought he had it tough. <laughs> I'd like to see how Peter Slipper dealt with that lot. <laughs> and, and just in case you think in those days that, uh, well, as Mungo says, it was a bit, bit of fun, but um, this is, uh, I'll get you to read this, Mungo, this is, this is Deacon on Reed, on George Reed, who you feel was rather badly treated by history. I do just, indeed, just, just but read, he, in, the day, in the day he was seen as a bit of a buffoon, and um, Deacon, affable Alfred as he was known, who had a bit of a way with words, uh, wrote of his immense unwieldy jelly-like stomach, always threatening to break his waistband, his little legs apparently bowed under its weight to the verge of their endurance, his thick neck rising behind his ears to his many-folded chin, his protuberant blue eyes were expressionless until roused or half-hidden in cunning, and a blonde complexion and an infantile breadth of baldness gave him an air of infinite, insolent juvenility. <laughs> I think Keating's vitriol was much more to the point, don't you? Well, I would have tended to be too, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... So Fisher was the first, I suppose, successful Labour well, he was, politician, he was, and that was a point where... Well, Fisher, Andrew Fisher, who was Labour's second leader after the hapless Chris Watson, was not only one of Labour's most successful leaders, he was the most successful leader in those ten year, first ten years of any politician, when you think of it.
because he was the first politician who actually won a majority for his party in the House of Representatives. The rest had all been minority governments, they'd all been depending on support from the other parties, but Fisher actually took power in his own right, both in the reps and in the Senate. And that, of course, set the scene for everything that happened since. It, since then, every election has been Labor versus anti-Labor. The anti-Labor people have called themselves by various different names, but that's essentially been it, Conservative versus Labor. I'm going to skip forward to Billy Hughes, William <coughs> Morris Hughes, who, uh, for, for several reasons, certainly that he was one of the most colourful members of the parliament, he was, I think, the longest serving. I mean, did he not oh, set a record yes. that will never be broken? Never, never, ever be broken. Billy Hughes served for 50 years in the Parliament and actually dropped yeah, dead in 1953, um, I think it was. Must have been 102 years. <laughs> so he, he was never out of Parliament. And and uh, thirdly, he was the Labor. He was the first Labor rat as a as a Prime Minister. Well, he was the first Labor rat as a Prime Minister. And uh, he set some sort of a record for ratting. He, he ratted against several parties on and off. Um, he, he was thought to be a well, serial rat. And on, on one of, and one of the many dinners held to celebrate his longevity as a parliamentarian, he was asked, uh, hey, Billy, how come you've joined every other party but you never joined the country party? <laughs> and Billy looked at him and said, Look, a man's got to draw, draw the, the line, line somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> we might not get to talk properly about Billy McMahon. I've got, to, I've got to get you to... Well, I've got to refer to this one. This is, this is the other Billy, Billy McMahon. Um, Holt had liked to describe himself... This is Mungo's words. Holt had liked to describe himself as first amongst equals. The commentators were quick, quick to label Billy McMahon as the worst among sequels. <laughs> Actually, uh, that was mine. <laughs> more, on, more on that later. More on that later. So, you, at, at least in quoting yourself, you had the grace not to, not to credit it. Oh, no. certainly not. <laughs> um, and uh, and Hughes was also there for the, for the First World War and the con that conscription. Mm, uh, and the first great Labor split, which, when he led half the Labor Party out into the into another room, and then eventually merged with the Conservative Nationalists, and that again was left Labor in the wilderness for a long time, with something it got rather used to over the years. <laughs> so there, there was, I mean, through the the twenties and the thirties, what what would you say were the kind of hallmarks? I mean, I know the Depression was in the middle of that, which led into the Second World War. Um, and you had, uh, you had Stanley, you had Bruce? You had Cook, Bruce, Page, I mean... All, all Scullin all, briefly. Yes, all of Scullin very briefly over the Depression and then from that you sagged into Joe Lyons, yes. who was the second great Labor rat. He, he'd been tempted from the Labor Party to join the, the Nationalists as they then were. They merged into the United Australia Party and they too were in power for a very long time. Um, Lyons was one of those sort of homely sort of blokes. He, uh, he had lots and lots, he was a, a, a Tasmanian Roman Catholic with lots and lots and lots of children. Was never really, never seemed to be quite sure how many actually. <laughs> and he was the man who developed the idea of the fireside chat over the radio. Radio being a newfangled mechanism in those days. And, he exploited it brilliantly. As far as we know, he never actually did very much. Um, his government was notable mainly for just staying in power mm. and, uh, and for, for a long time, keeping the young Robert Menzies out of the leadership, which is something else he became notable for later in life. I know that in your book, you, you and, and the, the purpose of the book is, is looking at the kind of hallmark elements of, the, of, of each of the prime ministers and what it was about their leadership and, and in passing you note those things that were or were not notable, uh, the, the things that they might have achieved by way of reform or by way of policy, yes, but you get the sense through that period of the 30s that there wasn't actually all that much no, the, landmark policy. No, the 30s was a bit like the 50s in Australia. It was a time when nothing much seemed to happen. It was a steady-as-she-goes period. 
And that again is one of the characteristics of Australian politics. So uh, that's a bit like the classic description of war, periods of frantic activity interspersed with long periods of boredom. And that really is how Australian politics tends to work. And of course, most of the periods of frantic activity are those when Labor's in power. Well, I'm, I'm going to, before we throw it to, uh, to the rest of you, I just want to, I'm going to go through a few more of the particular leaders and I want to draw from that to a quick discussion, a quick opening discussion about what it is that actually makes great leadership and good leadership. Um, so then came Curtin, well, the, then came Menzies and then came Curtin and Menzies had that brief period uh, and, and then came Curtin in the war as the Labor PM. Mm. So let's just focus on that <coughs> brief period. Okay, well, Menzies, of course, took Australia into the Second World War, but was rightly regarded by his own party as not really fit to lead. He, he took a long vacation to London, hoping that Churchill had put him into the British War Cabinet. That didn't happen, and by the time he came back, his party was sick of him and threw him out, and was so sick of him, in fact, that they didn't even demand the leadership, the prime ministership, for another one of their own. They gave it to Arthur Fadden from the Country Party. Mm. When a very brief interregnum before, the, before Fadden went to, and John Curtin took over. And Curtin was a very interesting character. He was, a, he was an intellectual, he was a pacifist, he was a reformed drunk. He was a, a very lefty man in his youth, although he changed a bit over the years. He was always still a, a socialist and an unashamed socialist. And, but, and his colleagues were never quite sure if he had the steadiness of purpose or nerve or, or ability to lead. And then suddenly, when, when he became the wartime leader, all that insecurity dropped away from him. But, not, but a lot of agonies, a lot of agonies. Oh, absolute, absolute agony. I mean, he suffered like very few people have suffered over. He really felt for the troops, for what was happening to them. He worried constantly about the possibility of Japanese, actual Japanese invasion of Australia. He um, agonised over introducing conscription. He agonised over... Limited conscription. Yes, he, he had been one of the great opponents of Billy Hughes over conscription in the First World War, but found that he was more or less forced to introduce limited conscription in the Second World War because he felt correctly that it was utterly unfair that American conscripts based in Australia were fighting for Australia, while in Papua New Guinea and places where Australian conscripts weren't. So he, against all the Labor Party's traditions and his own better feelings, was forced to introduce conscription. And he became, as a result, um, out of some, of the, some people in the party never really forgave him for that. But he was obviously a popular hero and died within sight of wartime victory, but before it was actually realised. Nobody would argue that, I, I suppose, if longevity uh, alone is the, uh, is the measure, no. that, uh, that if longevity alone is the measure, you might argue that Robert Menzies was Australia's greatest political or greatest Prime Minister in political terms simply because he uh, was there the longest, post-war, 1949 yes, to 1966 certainly. or whatever it was. But, uh, <coughs> but, but it seems, mm -hmm. by and large, that Curtin is recognised as a strong, well, there'd be, well, a, there'd be a number of people who'd argue it, I know. But if you argue that Curtin was Australia's greatest Prime Minister, what was the essence of that? Well, I'd argue not necessarily that he was Australia's greatest. I, I hesitate to use that word because yes. it covers too much ground. But he, he was certainly um, Australia's most courageous Prime Minister in that he faced almost impossible situation and with his, all his own character weaknesses worked his way through it. He was a great tragic figure, Curtin. Um, and I think probably he was um, regarded by many as a man who saved Australia, the man who was indispensable. Arthur Fadden in the country part, he always thought of him like that. He took on, he took on uh, Churchill. He took on Churchill, he demanded that Australian troops be allowed to come home and defend Australia's shores when Churchill wanted to send them to Burma. Um, Churchill resisted to the last minute and uh, Curtin said no, 
I am a sovereign prime minister of a sovereign country and this is what's going to happen. And eventually, of course, it did. Now, I'm going to pass over Chifley, but if anyone wants to ask a Chifley question, feel free, because because this part of the thing is, uh, is getting yeah. close to time and we haven't even got to contemporaries yet. <laughs> um, Oh, but we can uh, brush over but, them pretty but you quickly. Can't, I mean, you, you, can't, uh, you can't pass through Menzies 17 years or whatever it was in a blink of an eye. I mean, Well, you pretty uh, well in can in historical <laughs> terms, actually. I mean, not, in ter you, not, not in terms of his influence on the course of Australian history. Well, when you look at Menzies' legacy, I mean, certainly a lot of things happened during Menzies' term. I mean, he took us into three wars to start with. But... Um, uh, and of course, Although how he got us into Korea is very interesting. Well, how the decision was actually made while he was on a ship between yeah. Britain and uh, America. And how he got us into Vietnam was even more interesting mm. because he had to wait for the, um, the Americans to arrange for a cable to come from Saigon inviting us. But uh, that, was all, that was all part of the Menzies era. And in that sense, I mean, it was full of in interesting events, a, a near depression at one stage, or another, another great split in the Labor Party, enormous shit fights over communism, one Cold War, one way and another. But when you look at the actual legacy of Menzies in terms of institutions, in terms of legislation, um, OK, so we had... Uh, government aid to church schools and the form of science laboratories. We had a development of the university system, Commonwealth certainly. Scholarships. Commonwealth scholarship, well, the university system generally. Yes. Uh, um, but which, which is not insignificant. No, it's not insignificant, but there were none of the great, um, what we would now regard as the great economic reforms, the ground changing things in in history during all that time. I mean, Menzies himself called his memoirs Afternoon Light, <laughs> and there was a sort of feeling that even under Menzies it was always just a late sunny summer's afternoon. I think that's a, I think that's a bit unkind, my guy. <laughs> he might have been referring to his reflections at the age of 70-something. <laughs> he always seemed to be 70-something. <laughs> well, he certainly had a great loyalty to Australian cricket. Um, <laughs> Again, well, I'll he think. was taught. He was taught about cricket by Jack Fingleton, the great Australian batsman who became a journalist in the press gallery. There's some That's doubt true. as to That's how true. much he really knew about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to jump forward again. Past uh, look, this is uh, it's time is time is always the tyr it's the tyranny of time at these events. We, we're not even going to we're not going to we, we acknowledge on the way through how, uh, Holt's drowning. Nice man, mm -hmm. not a bad treasurer, um, but but came and went as a prime minister. Gorton, fascinating period, and, uh, and quite that, a landmark prime minister. In his own very place. important prime minister, Gorton, I think, um, because he took on because he was a risk taker. He took on his own party. He took on the, all those old liberal shibboleths of states' rights and and not interfering in all the state areas. Uh, he, he took on a very formidable lot of premiers, like people like Henry Bolte and Robin Askin and Charlie Court. He was not a, an inconsiderable man. And uh, the Labor Party, in fact, regarded him as a very near miss. Gorton could have, if he'd arrived a bit earlier and had been a little less self-indulgent, could have been a very, a very important Prime Minister. And in fact, um, uh, people talk about um Kim Beasley being uh, somewhat prolix. Uh, Gordon yes. became renowned for what was simply known as Gordonisms. Can you just read this one? The, the health scheme. Yes. <laughs> but it was one of many, wasn't it? Yes, one of many, but um, this is Gordon explaining how his version of a public health scheme would work. On the other hand, the AMA agrees with us, or I believe will agree with us, that it is its policy, and it will be its policy, to inform patients who ask what the common fee is and what our own fee is, so that the patient will know whether he is going to be operated on, if that's what it is, on the basis of the common fee or not. <laughs> <laughs> that was one aspect of it. Yeah, the, well, that sorted it out, didn't there, it? <laughs> there, were many, there were many others. Um, Whitlam, I, I don't know how we um, resolve Whitlam in one and a half minutes, but um, um, 
<coughs> in fact, I don't think we're even going to try. Let's hope it gets teased out. Well, no, can, but let's, let, let's but just not make one point about Whitlam. Whitlam was in the same mould in many ways as Gorton. He was a leader who took on his own party, took on all the things that he believed it had, uh, kept it in the past, kept it in opposition, um, crashed through or crashed in his own words, and was uh, didn't last for very long. But by golly, he did a lot while he was there. It was a it was a two-fronted thing, wasn't it? It was the reforms that he uh, introduced through the program, and it was uh, and it was uh, the reforms inside his own party. Where well, he, dragged, he dragged them kicking and screaming. He dragged them kicking and screaming to the table first, and that was what enabled him to put the program into place. Okay, so let's move forward. Then there was um, uh, then there was Fraser, and there was Hawke Keating, Howard. And, the, and I mean, we know all that. This is everyone's lived with this. Some of you uh, have memories going way back. But um, uh, so, can so I just say, can I just say that Keating's the third one in my trio of important prime ministers, because he again was somebody who broke all the rules, took on his own party in the economic reforms, although there's still argument about how much of it was Hawke and how much of it was Keating. There's no doubt that the driving force was Keating and he defied the Labor Party, he sold Qantas, he sold the Commonwealth Bank, he brought in foreign banks into Australia, floated the dollar, all these things which were regarded as politically impossible and against all Australia's traditions and he, he again crashed through and eventually crashed. And that's, that's a, an interesting thing about Australia, maybe it would be true of other countries. America for instance is a very conservative country by nature in terms of how it, how it uh, deals with its politics but um, Australians on the one hand are impatient with boring Prime Ministers, they're impatient with Prime Ministers who don't seem to be doing things but when Prime Ministers do things Australians don't necessarily like it. Not at all. I think Australians basically want to be looked after by their Prime Ministers. I don't think they mind really what Prime Ministers do as long as it doesn't worry them. Um, <laughs> and yet they want excitement. They, they, want, they want excitement they but want, they don't. They, they want a frisson of excitement but they prefer it happen to somebody else rather than to them. <laughs> and I think that's, that's always been the pattern of Australia and, and that's why the real activists, the Gortons, Whitlams and Keatings, don't last very long. They could do a lot in a very short time, but eventually they frighten the voters too much altogether and the voters go back to what they hope and pray, and are often very wrong about, will be the safe conservative alternative. Now, I'm not sure that you made this point in the book. I mean, you, you've singled out Keating rather than Hawke, even though Hawke was there longer than Keating, although oh, Keating, yes. was, Keating was obviously an important part of the Hawke ministry. But uh, I've, I've heard... Um, ministers who sat round the cabinet table with Hawke, including those who didn't particularly like him, in fact some who disliked him intensely, who were all prepared to acknowledge that the that this great strength of Hawke as a leader was that he was a he was a great chairman of the cabinet, he was a consensus a, a successful consensus prime minister and that he had a capacity to um, to cede autonomy to his ministers, or most of them anyway. Well, uh, and, and, and allow extent, them to get on yeah. with their own jobs. He actually trusted them in the job, which is quite pertinent to that, part of what's happening That's today. absolutely true, but you've also got to remember that he had an exceptional group of ministers to trust. Mm. That whole first talk ministry that he brought into power in 1983 is, for my money, pound for pound, by far the best ministry Australia's ever had. Incomparably the best ministry. And they weren't amateurs. I mean, there were people who'd been around the traps for a long time. They, a lot of them had experience of government from the Whitlam years, knew what the traps of that were, had learnt from it, knew what to avoid, knew what to push. And so they were able to do it. But um, Kerry's quite right. I mean, Hawke was a great consensus prime minister. A lot of us thought before he became Prime Minister, in fact, before he went into Parliament, that he would be manifestly unsuited to the job, that uh, he would be too much of a mug lair, that he'd be too much of an exhibitionist, a show-off, an egotist. But and, and occasionally distracted elsewhere. And occasionally, just occasionally, um, in, in search of a drink and a Donald, as we say. But uh, um, he did, he did, as a, in the end, 
turn out to be a very important, very fine Prime Minister and of course he won four elections which is something no other Labor Prime Minister has ever looked like. So we come to the current day um, and... Uh, oh, must we? <laughs> well, Tony Abbott would say, why not? <laughs> Look, I've already done six radio pieces and an article for the age about the current day. <laughs> Mungo, you're relevant. <laughs> um, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure even what question to ask, but uh, while on the one hand... Uh, Tony, Tony, and ask me who's, who's going to win, <laughs> and I will tell you, nobody, and especially not us. Well, certainly not on the Labor side. I mean, mm. um, it seems to me that Labor has managed to dig itself into a situation like no other it's ever had before. And you hesitate to say that in history because there's always somebody to pipe up and say, well, what about 1914, December 10? Um, but, but the fact that regardless of the outcome, uh, they are pretty screwed. Well, it certainly looks like it. I wrote a couple of weeks ago that there's a position in chess called Zugzwang, which means that whatever move you make, you put yourself in a worse position than you were before. And I think the Labor Party is pretty much in that position now. And the thing I find impressive about this one is the enormous sense of self-righteousness there is on both sides. I mean, this isn't just a political stoush with a couple of people who want to be Prime Minister. This is a holy war. This is a, a battle between two people who are so convinced of their righteousness that they'll bring on Armageddon rather than give up. And this is not a good position for a party to be in. And it is, well, it's it's mostly about personalities because it's not just the personalities of no. Gillard and Rudd, is it? And the other thing that's um, tended to exacerbate this is the bloody weekly opinion polls. The weekly opinion polls are a curse on politics because they're based on they're based on bullshit. I mean, the the, the poll question is. If an election were to be held next weekend, which party would receive your first preference? Well, hang on, an election isn't going to be held next weekend. It's a pure fantasy, a hypothetical question. But, but it means everybody talks as if it is going to be held next weekend. Everybody thinks in terms of that next weekend polling instead of being able to think on a, on a longer, more sensible <coughs> viewpoint. But Mungo, doesn't, doesn't the polling paint a picture over time? No, if you it took doesn't. it over 12 it months no. or two years, well, it, it does surely, well, to it some paint, degree, it, reflect... But a, it, it paints the wrong picture. It, paint, it paints a picture of people thinking in terms of an immediate election. Now, OK, polling during an election period makes sense. Leading up to an election, you can see trends emerging and you can see what's going on. But in the in this weekly idea that, oh, Julia Gillard's up one point, Tony Abbott's down two points, I mean, but do blah, you know blah, what, blah, it doesn't mean anything because do you know the question is, doesn't mean anything. Do you know what I think has changed? I think what has changed is the media's dependence on yeah. opinion polls oh, to make... give them one certain story each week, or even if they're Absolutely. lucky, two or three days of it, Absolutely. Where, where they can pick up on something and follow it, yes, because but... they've got nothing fucking else. <laughs> to find. That's absolutely true. That, that, that's because of the polls. And, and because the polls are based on bullshit, it means most of the stories are based on bullshit too. That they're reacting to a, a poll asks a silly question, very often gets a silly answer. And that becomes what's meant to be a serious news story, um, analysed page after page by pundits, as if it mattered. To it doesn't. Until, we're with, until an election is actually called, opinion polls about who are you going to vote for mean nothing. Perhaps the most famous illustration of that, or infamous illustration of that, was the bulletin uh, cover yes. that came out at a particular point in one of Howard's leaderships. Mm. And the headline was a photo of uh, Howard and a headline, Tomorrow's Feather Duster, I think. And, uh, well, and the headline was, was Mr. 19%. No, why does this man bother? Mm. Yeah. Mr. 19%. Yeah, actually, I think it was 18%. It was a sub yeah. <laughs> 18, Mr. 18%. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, of course, he went on to be Australia's second longest serving Prime Minister. Can I ask a question that goes back to the book? Sure. Uh, it follows from Kerry's question. Um, 
You spent a lot of time on the book. Not a hell of a lot, I suspect, but a lot. Uh, what, Most of it was in his head. What, what insights did you get um, as to what really a good Prime Minister, what properties he had to have to be a good Prime Minister? The most important single, single thing you need is courage. That you've got to have the nerve to do things, to take on the unpop, take the unpopular decisions, take on your own party if necessary, if it's against you, do it to crash or crash through. But I think that's the most important single thing. Now, that assumes you've become prime minister, and the qualities needed to become prime minister are much more different and much more complicated. But once you have become prime minister, I think more than anything else, what you need is courage. But isn't it? Oh, and you, oh well, judgment is that uh, judgment comes into it, obviously, but. Um, the, 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 the achieving Prime Ministers, the Prime Ministers who have changed the country, who have left their mark on it, haven't been in office for very long. I mean, um, three, four, five years, I think Keating was five years, and he's the longest of the ones I reckon made it, um, did a serious amount of good for the country. But um, uh, the, the, the other, I mean, one huge dynamic in this age is the capacity to communicate, Mungo. Oh, you've absolutely. got this intense scrutiny on you. But the judgment on when to speak to the media, not just how to speak to the media. And if to speak to the media at all, certainly. <laughs> but, and, uh, but I think, well, I mean, that, that's all part of it. But uh, that, doesn't, that really matters very little if you haven't got anything to speak to the media about. Well, so you've, got to have the courage to you've got to have the courage to make those decisions first. Yeah, but I mean, what? Coming back to the polls very quickly, and those those things that you would say are what's gone wrong. We cannot let the media off the hook in this, and it's not. Just, no, I'm not. And it's not just about. It's not just about. You can argue about standards of journalism and so on, but what what has really changed dramatically is the extent to which the media now desperately needs to fill space, 24 hours a day, and they put incredible demands on the politicians. And the politicians, by and large, have fallen for that because they felt, and Howard was one, um, uh, Rudd was another, felt that they could use it to their advantage. Mm. And, and certainly it was true of, of Hawke as well. Hawke saw himself as the great communicator, yeah, having the love affair with the Australian people. Keating mm. loved to explain. But it's just got out of hand, hasn't it? It's got completely out of hand. But I also think one of the reasons for this is that Politicians put far too much importance on the media. They believe that the media has far more influence than the media really does. Um, the media does not... I, I've now been watching elections one way or another fairly closely since 1963, and I can say without hesitation that not one single federal election result has been changed by the media. There have been changes of emphasis, sure, um, the media has meant that parties have won or lost by more than they might have otherwise, but not one result has been changed by the media. Um, 1961 was nearly changed by the fact that Robert Menzies um, incurred the ire of Warwick Fairfax. Yes, but nearly, but not quite. One vote, one seat. Yeah, one seat, but nearly, but not quite. <laughs> And of course, that do, you want to, that. do you want to shed some light on how Robert Menzies incurred the ire of Warwick Fairfax? Well, Robert Menzies was having an affair with his wife. <laughs> <laughs> it was alleged. Yeah, yeah actually, to be fair. It's a, it's a, <laughs> Warwick, Warwick Fairfax certainly believed it. Yes, uh, well, so, so did everybody in the press gallery at the time, I might say. I've spoken to many of them. <laughs> no, Question for you, Mungo, is um, who, do we, who do we vote for? Do, I mean, you've had so much experience. Who do we really vote for? Do we vote for the personality, the Prime Minister that runs around at election time and drops into every electorate? Or do we... Are we uh, that governs the part that decides the party that becomes the elected party, or are we actually voting for the local member of Page? Well, or some whatever? of us are and some of us aren't. I mean, you can't generalise about that. I mean, a very active and personable local member can pick up votes in his or her own right, certainly, irrespective of what party they belong to. But um, 
and on the other hand there are uh, there's a rusted on core of people for each of the major parties who'd never dream of voting for the other party i mean that's that's the fascinating thing about the australian electorate it is diverse um, you can't predict exactly how any one person or one section of it is going to vote from one minute to the next uh, i do believe very strongly that uh, this is one of the great advantages of compulsory voting that you don't have that ability of one small pressure group to mobilise a, a, a vote and, and to throw undue influence on the system. Everybody's got to vote and therefore everybody um, has to take at least a passing interest in some aspects of the system, even if they don't really want to. Well, just in that context, Mungo, how do you feel about a situation and, and how it relates to democracy <coughs> where, for instance, uh, when there's an issue like the mining tax, that the mining industry is, is able to throw so much money behind its own campaign for its own self-interest. Mm. Uh, and if there was somebody from the mining industry here, they might say, well, we can argue it's, it was all, it's also in the interest of the country, in the same way the trade union movement can throw so much mm. money and weight behind a campaign on yeah, the sure. fair work. I'd, uh, I'd rather they couldn't, obviously, but I can't see any democratic way of limiting it or of changing it. And I think it's really up to the other side, the opposition. I mean, John, during the trade union movement's Fair Work campaign, John Howard was constantly pleading with the business community to come out and spend a few quid and counter their, counter their advertising campaign. And the business community, for various reasons, decided not to. Well, a lot of them did. Some did, some didn't. Well, yeah, but an awful lot didn't. Yeah. There was certainly no concerted campaign in the way that the union movement was. And again, with the miners, um, eventually the government attempted to run its own campaign, but it was far too little and too late and too badly put together. I mean, I think, I think really the answer to that is um, you make sure before you put those very controversial policies on the table or into place that the electorate does understand them, is, is inured to them, and therefore, the, any serious um, scare advertising campaign will be as ineffective as possible. Um, <coughs> just go back to a question, a few <coughs> questions ago by the gentleman seated in front of me. He asked about the properties and the qualities of a, what a good Prime Minister, what he should have. What about she, Julia Gillard? I would like to un, uh, hear your personal opinion, Terry and Mungo, if she has those qualities to be a good Prime Minister. Um, she's got some of them, certainly. She's got the courage, she's got the persistence. But um, while there, she's got courage to push ahead with things which are in front of her, she doesn't seem to me to have the courage to work out interesting and sensible and saleable ideas. I mean, the thing about Julia was that she came into the job at the wrong time. She wasn't ready for it. Under the normal course of events, Kevin would have served another term, term and a half, and then given way to her, she would have had come in with her own agenda, everybody prepared, everything legitimate, everything hunky-dory. But that, that didn't happen. She was thrust into it totally unprepared. She had no agenda of her own. She was left to tidy up the ends of Kevin's agenda. And then was persuaded to run it uh, yeah. very early, not even ran, giving ran herself was, yes. two or three months to bid in. Yes, and ran, ran, ran an election far too early, and it was an appalling campaign, even without the disruption that was part of it. And so from that point on, I mean, she's always been hamstrung, and now, of course, she's hamstrung by the hung parliament. So it's... It's hardly, it's hardly a level playing field. I mean, I, I think Julia Gillard probably had the potential to be a good Prime Minister had things worked out properly and had she come to the job at the right time. But as it is, no, she's floundering. And uh, look, there, there is a case to be made that, uh, and, and uh, many of you may have, I'm, I'm sure you've read at least some of the stories that, of, of about Rudd's time as Prime Minister and, and how it came to pass that his colleagues almost <coughs> universally turned their backs on him. But there were stories you would hear and one of them was that when by the time Rudd would go overseas as Prime Minister on his next trip that uh, his in-tray would be stacked very high with decisions waiting to be made but because he was so focused on the vision and the program and micromanaging everything he didn't actually have time for the day job. 
So he would go overseas, Julia would come in as Deputy Prime Minister, as Acting Prime Minister, she'd clear the in-trade. The public service servants apparently loved her. She would go back to a job, he'd return, stack the in-tray up again, he'd go overseas again, she'd come mm -hmm. in and clear it. Uh, and you see, I mean, the reputation she's built up as Prime Minister inside what our equivalent of the Beltway is in Australia is that, is that um, uh, she has actually made a very difficult um, minority government function. And you can argue about the merits of this policy versus that policy, but if you actually analyse it, if you actually look at it, once they got past all of that, um, all of the, the sort of daily picking at and scandal and, uh, and scrutiny of the massive amount of money that was spent very fast to do with stimulating the economy and things like the schools program and so on, that, that with her government, that by and large ministers have got on with their jobs. I'm not saying the policies are necessarily right, but the policy, it seems, has been administered pretty efficiently. Ministers, public servants have got on with their jobs. But out here, around Australia, you get the sense that this has been a government in permanent crisis. And that has partly been to do, I think, with the way it's been reported. Oh, sir. It's also partly been to do with the fact that Julia Gillard is not a great communicator. So you can argue till the cows come home about her virtues as an administrator, as a leader within her party and within the parliament, but she's not a great communicator. And because of the circumstances in which she became prime minister, there's always been that taint of illegitimacy about her prime ministership anyway. There's always been that feeling that she was installed by the faceless men. It was a midnight knock on the door. It was a stab in the back. It was a, uh, a coup. I mean, it wasn't the normal way that these things happen. It wasn't the slow public build-up that Keating mounted against Bob Hawke before he became Prime Minister. This was an overnight shock tactic. And that has meant that I think that she's always had that feeling that some or I don't know whether she has had that feeling, but there's always been that feeling around her that perhaps this isn't quite, quite legit, it's not quite fair income. I'm going to call it quits now. We could, uh, we could probably go on for a little while longer, but I think we're going to test people's patience. I'd rather leave with people still having a little thirst uh, than having uh, felt you drunk too much. I'm just going to finish by reading uh, from Mungo's final. This is one book where you're not going to give away the contents uh, by reading the last paragraph. He says, uh, The pioneers who welded the brawling colonies of the 19th century into the extraordinary structure that is Australia had much to be proud of, and we have much to thank them and all their successors for. It is to those 26 men and one woman that this book is gratefully dedicated. Uh, which I think is uh, very generous and very true, despite the fact that you'll find some wonderful lines uh, directed at many of them on the way through. Mungo, I think we all owe you a debt of gratitude for writing this book. There is, to my knowledge, nothing quite like it, and, uh, and it's terrific. Thank you very much. For the night. Thank you very much indeed.